Hello. In this recording, we'll talk about some basic theoretical chromatography concepts that are applicable equally to gas chromatography, liquid chromatography, and a few other kinds as well. So, I'll start with this picture from SCOOG, um, Principles of an Instrumental Analysis, 7th edition. And in it, it talks about the basic idea of chromatography. So you have a column that's packed with some sort of material, or it could be just a thin capillary tube where the walls are coated, as is common in gas chromatography. But in any case, so then you have your analytes that you put on top. The analyte meaning the thing you wish to measure, or separate in this case. And, okay, this is a mixture of A plus B, you put it in here, and then you apply a mobile phase that flows past the stationary phase and down this away. And so, as you do this, the components start to separate. So A and B separate a little bit here. As they go farther down the column, A is attracted to the stationary phase a little less than B, so A spends more time in the mobile phase, and a hits the end of the column first, so it elutes from the column first. And if we have a detector here and we're measuring things as they elute, we would see A come out first at some time. And then a little while later, B, which has been retained by the column a little more, B will elute. Great. So why does this work? It works because the analytes are in this continual equilibrium process between the mobile phase and the stationary phase. So I drew this freaky looking diagram and the gray blobs, oops, excuse me, the gray blobs are the stationary phase. This is a pretty bad stationary phase because they're not uniformly sized and they're not spherical perfectly, whatever. And the mobile phase are all these dots. And so these red dots could be your analyte, either on the stationary phase, either absorbed to the surface or dissolved in the liquid coating of this, because a lot of columns have a little liquid coating around the beads inside. And this might be your analyte in the mobile phase, free to move. And so your analyte's in equilibrium between the mobile phase and the stationary phase. And if the analyte's in the mobile phase, then it'll move on down the column if the analyte's in the stationary phase, it won't. And the key here is that different analytes will have a different equilibrium position here, and they will spend either more time in the mobile phase or less time in the mobile phase, more in the stationary phase, and then the different analytes will elute down the column at different speeds because of this different equilibrium positions that they have. So like all equilibrium, we can write an equilibrium constant for it, uh, this is really in terms of activities, but I omitted that here. So if you know what activities are, great. If you don't, don't worry about it. And so, right, like all good equilibrium constants, you have products and reactants. Um, this is called the distribution constant, or sometimes the partition coefficient. And yeah, different values of K mean different equilibrium positions. And since these are different for different analytes, you can separate them. For the same analyte, if you're changing conditions of your chromatography setup, then your equilibrium position can vary with what mobile phase you have. This is especially true if you do a gradient elution in HPLC, because you'll change the mobile phase as the chromatography run goes on, and then you'll change this K for your given analyte. Um, or if you switch columns, you have a different stationary phase, or if you change the temperature, a lot of times when you do chromatography, you care a lot about the temperature that you're doing it at, and so there's good reasons why. So we're interested in quantifying chromatography systems as a way to talk about how good or effective a certain chromatography system is. And, well, it'd be great if we could just measure K and use that as our kind of metric. But unfortunately, you can't directly measure that equilibrium constant. And so instead, what we do is we will measure retention time and use that to calculate a few things, including selectivity and theoretical plates and stuff like that, that allows us to characterize the chromatographic system without directly measuring K, because you can't. So let's look at the chromatogram here on the left, and let me annotate it a bit. So we're going to talk about retention time, and so the retention time is easily measured, it's just how long it takes something to elute from the column. 
And so from the start time to when it elutes, this would be the retention time of A. This here would be the retention time of B. Now, retention time includes the time that your analyte spends in the stationary phase, and also the time that it spends in the mobile phase. And so you can write this as TR retention time is stationary phase TS, mobile phase TM. Here I'm using these little funky T's to show that it's a T and not a plus or something else. Okay, so that's retention time. It's a number that we use a lot because you can very easily get it from your chromatogram. Great. Now it's also fairly easy to measure TM, the time that an analyte spends in the mobile phase, because that's really constant for all the compounds because the time in the mobile phase depends on just how long it takes the liquid to go through the column because that would push an analyte through the column. And so we can usually measure this too. And so the way we do that is we go back up to our diagram over here on the left and realize that there's also solvent that we put in with A and B. And that solvent will travel down the column at the rate of speed as the mobile phase, because usually you try to match the solvent to what your mobile phase is, either closely or exactly. And so in the next picture here, this will move down the column faster than the analytes. And then eventually it elutes from the column at a time that we um, call TM, which in words we'll call that the dead time or the void time. And you also call this the solvent peak because in your chromatogram you'll see a peak and it's from the solvent. Usually you'll see a little wiggle at a constant time for a given setup and flow rate and everything that is from your solvent. Even if you match the mobile phase perfectly, your little injected bit of solvent isn't going to be quite exactly the same and so you'll often see a little wiggle where your solvent elutes past your detector. So cool, we can measure that too and we can use that to characterize our systems further. So we'll talk about the retention factor. That's another way we can talk about these um, chromatographic systems. The nice thing about retention factor is that it's independent of flow rate and column geometry. So it just depends on mobile phase and the chemistry and your analyte. But if you change your flow rate, then the retention factor stays the same. And this works by talking about TS, right? So if you're going to calculate just TS, then you would take TR and subtract TM from it. And so this is the amount of time your analyte spends in the stationary phase divided by TM, which is how fast solvent elutes from the column. And because this ratio is set up as it is, then you can get a retention factor, which tells you about how, a, um, how an analyte is retained in the column, independent of flow rate. So that's one number we can use to talk about chromatography, the retention factor. Okay, now next thing we'll talk about is the selectivity factor. So selectivity factor tells us how well two components are separated in our chromatographic run or experiment. Now this is done by taking the retention times for two components. Selectivity factor is, needs to talk about two components at once. And so I've taken the retention time for A, component A, and the retention time for component B, a is the one that elutes sooner, B is the one that elutes later, that's important for this calculation. And you subtract TM from both of them, so you're just talking about the amount of time that a compound is retained on the stationary phase, and make a ratio. And this ratio is always defined to be greater than 1, that's why B has to elute later than A for this to work. We're just defining something so we can define it however we, however we want, and then the trick is everybody after that has to use it the same way. So make sure your number is bigger than one. Cool. That's the selectivity factor. You just calculate it and it works. And now why do we care about the selectivity factor? Well, when you're talking about a separation or a column you might want to buy and you have two components you want to separate, you really want to know what the selectivity factor is between these two components. Now there's a limit here, right? Because in this particular diagram, you're chromatogram goes back to the baseline between A and B, so you can integrate them and evaluate them separately. If you push them farther apart, all you're going to do is waste time. So right there's an upper limit to what you might want. There's also a lower limit because you don't want these two peaks to overlap, then you can't integrate them separately and you can't resolve them very well. So that's what the selectivity factor can tell us.
Okay, now we wish to quantify column efficiency. How good is this column? And the thing we'll use for this is the number of theoretical plates, n. What the heck does that mean? Okay, so the person who first came up with this theory of column efficiency um, compared things to a distillation column. And you might not be super familiar with this because you're doing chemistry now and not 100 years ago, but back in the day distillation was one of the few ways to separate compounds. And you would do it in some sort of still like this, where you have these various trays and plates inside that the vapor goes up into this tray and then condenses again and then evaporates again. And this is under some sort of thermal gradient. It's hotter at the bottom where you heat it, a little cooler at the top. And this condensation and evaporation, condensation and evaporation step helps the separation of the components. And so if you look inside a still, you'll see these kinds of things. This is analogous to when you have a distillation column in organic chemistry and it's full of steel wool. The steel wool does the same thing. It gives the liquid a place to condense and then evaporate again. So these are plates. And the theory was to compare a chromatography column to a bunch of plates jammed together in a tube. This is a horrible actual comparison because chromatography columns don't have plates. They have spheres inside them packed very tightly, or maybe nothing at all in the case of a gas chromatography column that's unpacked. So uh, suspend belief for a minute. Pretend there are plates, even though there are no plates. Okay, so if there are plates, then each plate has a height. We're assuming we're jamming them right next to each other in a column. So you, to find the height of each plate, you basically take the length of the whole column, divide by the number of plates. You can also rearrange and get a formula that looks like this. And so sometimes people will talk about plate height or number of plates. Now, why are these numbers useful? Well, you want more plates per column because the separation has to do with the plates. Again, there's not really plates, but sure. The separation has to do with plates, so more of them is better. So your efficiency of your column increases as your number of plates increases which if you have more plates in your column, it means that your height decreases. So either one of these things are good. People will talk about number of plates or the height of plates, depends on what they feel like talking about. So you can see either one in places where you read such things. So the useful thing about calculating theoretical plates is that the math is actually really straightforward. So Skoog derives this in the textbook. I'll just give the answer here in that, say you have a chromatogram, you have your dead time or void time, TM, you have your peak here. Now you take the retention time and divide it by the width. And so this would be baseline width. And the baseline width is a little tricky to calculate because you have to take the line of your peak and extrapolate it down to the baseline and then see where it crosses the baseline and take that as one side of the peak and then take the intersection of these dashed lines on the other side of the peak and then that's your width. Then you multiply it by 16 and then you get n. Okay, now you can do this another way. You can rederive this formula in terms of the width at half height, which is a little easier to find because your computer will tell you the intensity at the top of the peak. You divide that by half. You go looking for some data points that are right around that y value. And then you see what the difference in x value is and you get a width that's at half height. And so that width at half height, then you put it in the same formula. Now you multiply by a different number and that gives you the same n. So use whichever formula you feel like using. That might depend on what information you're given or what's easier to find. I tend to use half height because this little bit about the corners here is kind of weird to me, but again, that depends on what information you have. So let me show an example now of what you might do with this. So this paper is really the best example I could find on the internet of a column acceptance report or certificate of analysis. And it basically shows you, when you buy a column, uh, it shows you that someone tested it and then it works. Because these things are, you know, $500 to $1,500, you would hope it works, right? And so they test them at the factory before they send them to you and they give you the results from the test in the box with the column, which is super useful.
So apologies if it's a little hard to see, but the pieces you have here is you have the conditions, right? A lot of these numbers and your chromatogram will change if you change the temperature. So the temperature is shown there, your flow rate is shown here, your solvent system is really important. So that's shown. So those details are necessary to be able to describe what you're doing. The flow rate is important. The injection volume, not as much for these calculations, but hey, it's in here because that's useful to be complete. Now then they, let me jump to the bottom actually, they show the chromatogram down here, and then here are the components in it. Peak one, the first one is uracil, then you have phenol, then 4-chloronitrobenzene, then toluene in order one, two, three, four. So in order to do these calculations, you have to specify which peak you're using. And so they specify that they do these calculations for toluene. Usually they'll use the last peak here. And they calculate theoretical plates, they calculate the selectivity, they calculate a retention factor, although they call it K prime, same thing. And cool, we can use this as, a, as an example to see how to calculate these things. So first up, let me annotate this. So the point of the uracil is because it is not retained by this type of column at all. This is a C18 column. Uracil is a very polar thing, so it doesn't want to go into the oily stationary phase. So this elutes at TM, so they're not relying on a little solvent wiggle. They put uracil in to give them the TM. And then they have the toluene peak. I have to give the retention time here because you can't read it, but it's kind of printed in small little numbers up here that I had to zoom way in to see. And then the same is true, I pulled TM off of here and wrote it so you can actually read it. Okay, so the retention factor is TR, the retention time, minus the dead time or void time divided by TM. And so we can take the numbers off the plot and plug them in. And we get a retention factor of 0.926 or 0.93, which matches what's on the acceptance report. Hey, there we go, that works. Now we can calculate selectivity. They don't quite specify in here what two peaks they're using because selectivity is a two peak thing. But turns out they're using toluene and then the next peak over, which makes the most sense because it'd be kind of weird to talk about selectivity of peaks that have something else in between them. So it's toluene and the four chloronitrobenzene that it's the selectivity there. So you can write this formula out. You need to know what the retention time is for peak three. So I put that in here for you as well. And then you calculate this, you get 1.65, which matches the time on the acceptance report. And then there's also um, a range that's specified. So presumably when you buy this, you would care a little bit about the these parameters, especially if you have something specific you're trying to do. And so this is showing that it's in spec for what they promise that this column can do. And then we can do the same thing with theoretical plates. I wrote the formula again. Now the half height they didn't, or the, the time, the width at half height they didn't list. I estimated it graphically and got about 0.041. And then I back calculated it from their result and got 0.0423. So pretty close for reading a fuzzy graph. I'll take it. Um, and then you plug these numbers in, into the formula, and you get a number of theoretical plates. Really, I only have three sig figs in what I'm doing, so I match the number given on the sheet to three sig figs. They probably have no business giving this to five sig figs, but they do anyways. And again, this is specified in the column literature for what this should be, and good to know that our column is performing a little bit above specifications. So hopefully these are useful examples of these types of calculations you can do to quantify columns. And thank you for watching.